Um, so we'll be talking about uh, uh, presenting some evidence or uh, result from empirical uh, research that uh, indicates uh, a new paradigm. And the new paradigm relates to uh, the nature of the greenhouse effect itself. Uh, we will be presenting, I'll, I'll talk about uh, how we came to this relationship and what the implications of that relationship is. Starting here is uh, a, a, a word of wisdom from a, a person who lived uh, around the, the, the turn of the century uh, uh, in Scotland, and he was not a scientist, but what he said I think very much applies to what we're talking about. Uh, in order to advance science, we really need to uh, be able to uh, uh, have open mind. Next. So our names are Ned Nikolov and Carl Zeller. Um, we are uh, from Colorado, from the beautiful state of Colorado uh, in the States. Uh, we're independent researchers and we um, uh, do not belong to any organization, political or otherwise. And uh, our stance has been that uh, science has to be impartial. And we are willing to support uh, any, any policy, any politics that uh, is in line with the scientific evidence. So whatever that is. So we, I want to say this up front, we don't have any political affiliation. We probably never will in, in the near future. <laughs> so uh, uh, the uh, information I'll be presenting here will allow you to answer this question. You can think about this question while the presentation goes on. And the question is, what do uh, a diesel engine and Earth's climate system have in common? Uh, the, the premise that uh, the, uh, the thing that, that put us on the, on the path of, of doing this research were a number of uh, apparent inconsistencies between observations and theory. And so our premise was in the, in the very beginning, um, uh, the idea that uh, um, uh, the temperature of Earth uh, should be determined by the same factors that are controlling the, uh, the temperature distribution across planets of the solar system. In other words, if we do um, uh, uh, analysis of the, uh, of the data uh, that, uh, 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 that currently exists uh, in the solar system, in order to derive the relationship, this relationship should be able to give us the main drivers that can explain the variation of, of climate on Earth over a long period of time. So I'll, if this premise is true, then the hypothesis that we put forward is that a, a model should exist, a uh, general model should exist that can explain the variation of, uh, of temperature across the planets in the solar system with a common set of drivers. Uh, to do this, we have looked at the, uh, at the solar system and have selected a number of bodies for analysis. And our analysis was based on, on three criteria. Number one, uh, we were looking for uh, bodies that have a hard surface because we want to assess the temperature of the surface temperature of planets. So that's, that implies the, the availability of the hard surface. Number two, uh, the, the, the planets that we work with should have good data uh, that are uh, based on uh, actual observations and high quality observations. And number three, the planets should span a very broad range of conditions. So here we have uh, six bodies uh, starting from Venus, Earth, Moon, Mars, Titan, which is a, um, a satellite of Saturn, and Triton, a satellite of Neptune. In terms of conditions, you can see that uh, they span a range from, in terms of solar radiation reaching the, the, uh, each of the, of the planets, spanning the range from about 2600 watts per square meter down to 1.5 watts per square meter. In terms of albedo, uh, the variation is from about uh, a 0.14 for the Moon to about a 0.90 for Venus. The atmospheric composition and the total pressure is equally stunningly uh, wide in terms of variation. So we have uh, a body like the Moon that has no greenhouse gases to, to Venus that has over 96% over of greenhouse gases and so forth. So this is a really a broad uh, uh, you know, uh, environments that represent a very broad range of conditions. Uh, so our analysis was based on a technique called dimensional analysis, which has been used in engineering in the past. It's a classical method. The technique basically uh, means uh, what, what it implies, that uh, the, the derivation of physically meaningful relationships 
uh, from empirical data without a reference to any theory. That's the power of it. In the old days when in fluid mechanics and other sciences where a process was not known well, you have a bunch of data, you want to make uh, sense of them, you actually apply this method to, to see if there is any relationship that are meaningful that you can use. By the way, everything that we call now fundamental science and theoretical science, uh, things like the Planck constant, the, the, the ideal gas constant, the gravitational constant, they're all based on measurements and fitting data. So the, 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 the information that's now in our theoretical science, it came originally from empirical measurements. So we're applying this approach, but on a planetary scale, not a, in a laboratory as, as was done in the past, in the beginning of the 20th century when the foundations of physics were placed. So the, the dimensional analysis, uh, uh, the key feature of the dimensional analysis is that uh, uh, it works by reducing the units that we use for variables that we're investigating, reducing them to a common set of, uh, of fundamental dimensions. Majority of the, um, uh, of the units or majority of the variables in physics and parameters, uh, they can be reduced to four fundamental, fundamental dimensions. Th those are absolute temperature, uh, identified here with theta, mass, m, l, length, and t, time. And for example, what I mean by that, uh, speed, for example, is measured in, uh, you can measure it in meter, in meter per second, per, per second. Uh, you can measure it in miles per hour, but fundamentally, speed is a length uh, by unit time, or length divided by time. In a similar fashion, uh, the, for example, here the uh, solar radiation that is measured in watts per square meter, when you do uh, the decomposition to fundamental dimensions, you actually end up that the watts per, per square meter equals mass divided by time cubed, something that is counterintuitive and you know, a lot of people don't realize that. And so, but with the same way, by the same token, you can, you, can, um, uh, you can see here relationships between variables that are otherwise not uh, obvious. For example, the uh, uh, flux, energy flux here, uh, being with those units of mass per, uh, per, per time cubed, uh, this, you, you obtain this unit by multiplying a pressure times the speed. So if you see the pressure has units of mass divided by length, divided by, by time uh, squared, if you multiply this by uh, length by time, you actually get this unit. So basically, by doing the measure analysis, you realize that uh, watts per square meter is a pressure times the speed of the moving particles. So this is a list of uh, variables that we have worked with, and we, you have here temperature, you have the solar radiation reaching to the planet, uh, to, the, to, to the top of the atmosphere of the planet. You have something called reference temperature, which uh, in our case is the temperature of the planet without atmosphere. So any planet that we studied that has atmosphere, we also calculate the temperature for that planet that without the atmosphere, and we'll get to that in a little bit later. Then we have the, the pressure and density, not only total pressure and density of the atmosphere, but also partial pressure and partial density of greenhouse gases. So the result from the dimensional analysis was uh, 12 models. Uh, once we got the non-dimensional numbers that are produced by the dimensional analysis, we have to find relationships. So here those 12 models have been explored with a, with a curve that is a, a common equation but has different shape because the regressions are different. And you could not see very well here, but you have uh, on the y-axis you have always a temperature ratio, which is the ratio of the planet to the, to the, to the temperature uh, of the planet without atmosphere. And then on the, on the x-axis you have different non-dimensional numbers that include the density, uh, uh, of the greenhouse gases, the, the partial pressure of greenhouse gases, the absolute uh, density, the absolute partial, pr the, the absolute uh, uh, pressure of the, of the atmosphere. And so out of, of all these models, the only one that actually uh, produced a very tight relationship is this number 12. And this is the, the relationship between the, uh, this temperature ratio, which we call it the relative temperature, you can call it, or because it's a ratio of temperature to the temperature with no atmosphere, it basically quantifies the thermal effect of the atmosphere, so we call it atmospheric thermal enhancement. This is another word for the greenhouse effect, which we think is more accurate than the, the current word, that we, the current term that's being used. So this is a log-log scale, and it, I can see the correlation is almost one. The error is very small. And by the way, this model is about 20 times more accurate than the second best model, which happened to be number one up here and behind. 
So there is a big difference between this model, this fit, and all the other uh, options. Here we have the curve uh, that is after the anti-log, and we have the actual equation. And here we, we see the uh, atmospheric thermal effect, which is on the y-axis, given with the temperature ratio, uh, as a function of total pressure. And you see that all the planets, they line up actually very, very, in a very nice way. The only little exception is Titan. It's very close to the curve. Uh, but the temperature of Titan was uncertain, so we have excluded actually Titan from the regression. On the bottom, you see the equation. Uh, uh, the, 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 the T sub NA is the equivalent of the temperature without the atmosphere. We have a handout for that. Uh, and uh, um, uh, you can read about that more. It was uh, based on work uh, published in 2014 by Volokin and Relais um, in uh, Springer Plus. Uh, so this is a whole topic by itself. We can talk about how this is done, uh, but we don't have the time right now. And maybe if we have discussion, if people are interested, I'll be happy to. Elaborate further. Okay, next. This thing is not very responsive. Okay, so here we're showing the absolute accuracy of the of the model, and uh, uh, as you say, as you can see, the for all the plants but Titan, uh, the accuracy of the curve that reproduces the current observed temperature is less than 0 0.17 degrees. I mean, this is engineering accuracy. This is not ecological or climatological accuracy. We're talking about something else here. So, uh, in order to test if this relationship actually it's, it's viable, there is a thing called statistical robustness. And that means that if you change the number of parameter, or the number of, uh, of data points, or you have a new data set, and you derive uh, another regression line, you can compare it to the original one and see uh, how far uh, it is from the original one. So here, this, this is exactly what we have done. Uh, the solid line is the uh, original equation that includes all the bodies. And the, uh, the dash line is the, a new regression equation that uh, uh, has uh, where we have removed the Earth and, and Titan from the uh, set of uh, data that is, using, is used to, to create the regression. And the idea was how close the new regression line can predict the temperature of Earth and Titan. And as you see here, the, uh, they are very close to, to the line. In fact, the new line predicts the temperature of Earth with an accuracy of 99.6%, which is within one degree. Now again, to repeat that, um, uh, the, uh, uh, the new regression line was derived by having uh, only Venus, uh, uh, Moon, Mars, Triton, and, uh, I'm sorry, uh, Mars and, and Triton in the regression line. So, so Titan and Earth were excluded. And yet, having those worlds that have nothing to do with Earth, very different, right? Uh, the Earth's temperature was predicted by this line, but by this curve, with an accuracy of 99.6%. So that tells you that Earth is a part of a cosmic continuum that is described by this, by this curve. Now, I, I didn't mention, but we're talking here about long-term average temperatures a long term meaning at least 30 years average. We're not talking about specific year or specific decade. We're talking long term equilibrium average temperature. So you can, you can look at this curve and you think about this like the, back, the backbone or the baseline of what determines climate. Because temperature is a direct, has a direct relationship with kinetic energy, which determines everything. So this is a, a temperature ratio that we have here is basically the ratio of energies. So then the question is, what, uh, uh, how we can explain this in terms of physical terms, this relationship? Is this an accident? Is this a statistical fluke? Or what is it? So uh, you know, if we go back to the, uh, to the basics of, of foundation of, uh, of physics, or in specifically in thermodynamics, we find out that temperature is proportional to the internal kinetic energy. This is of any system. We have a handout here for that one. Number two, people who want to look at that. Uh, Second, the, the energy, the kinetic energy, by definition, is a force applied over a distance, which is joule. One joule equals newton times, times the distance meters. Thirdly, uh, pressure itself is a force per unit area, so that the product of pressure times volume, this comes from the gas law, equals energy. This is something that we have all to be, all to be reminded about, because in climate science, it's quite often forgotten that uh, P times V is the kinetic energy of the atmosphere. Uh, and then, 
the, the three points above, uh, they, uh, they give us a conclusion that uh, the energy, the kinetic energy and temperature cannot exist without a force. That's a physical fact, meaning that uh, in any system where there's kinetic energy and temperature, you find some form of pressure. What do I mean? People say, what, what about radiation? Well, from a dimensional analysis, as, we, uh, as I mentioned before, uh, the energy flux, which is watts per square meter, this uh, refers to any energy flux, radiation included, is the pressure times the speed of the moving particles. So how many of you knew that uh, radiative flux uh, equals uh, photon pressure times the speed of light, that the light has pressure? Everybody knew about that? Good. So uh, this is known to uh, NASA, uh, the satellite that they send in orbit, if they don't do a correction for that, uh, for, the, for the effect of, of light as a pressure on the satellite, they, they drift off orbit. So here's the equation that any radiative flux is photon pressure times the speed of light. Since the speed of light is constant in any medium, that means that changing the um, intensity of radiation within a given medium, we're talking about changing the, uh, fluctuating the, uh, the pressure of photons, essentially. So that gives, an, uh, that gives an opportunity here to express a, we a very well-known law, the Stefan Boltzmann law, to express it in terms of, of photon pressure. How you do that? On, on the, on the right-hand side, you see the temperature given as a radiation divided by the Stefan Boltzmann constant uh, and the fourth root of that. And then if you divide both sides of this equation by, by, something, uh, by some constants, like, for example, the the temperature of this space, which happened to be, this is irreducible temperature of space, which has happened to be about 2.7 uh, Kelvin. Uh, on, on the temperature end, you divide this by, by T sub C, and on the radiation end, you divide the, the radiation uh, by the equivalent or the causative agent, agent of this cosmic temperature, which is the cosmic microwave background radiation, which happened to be a very small number. So you get this expression, a temperature ratio equals the fourth root of a radiation ratio. Well, further if you express the radiation in terms of uh, uh, photon pressure, come on, you get um, uh, an expression that gives you the temperature ratio as a, f as a, as a function of the, pre of, the, uh, of the ratio of pressures. Now, what is the shape of this relationship? You know, we can plot this, and here is the shape of this relationship. This is a new form, a new way of expressing the Stefan Boltzmann law. Okay, well, how, how this compares with uh, the relationship that we have just derived? Oops, I went too fast. Um, you can see that the shapes of those curves is, are very similar. They belong to different systems, so therefore the magnitude of the x and y axis are quite different. But the shape is very similar, and the other commonality is that in both cases we have a temperature ratio related to a pressure ratio. We have a third system that's called uh, uh, adiabatic heating, or the Poisson formula, that gives us the rate of change in temperature with pressure alone. And, uh, and here you, you have the third curve, which is eerily similar to the other two curves. So here we have a, a very strong qualitative resemblance uh, between uh, all the curves, right? So, so that tells you that uh, uh, there is something physical about this relationship at the very end that, that we have derived from the planet, that it's not a, uh, uh, a random event. Okay, so the, the conclusion from this is that this relationship that we just derived, uh, uh, it has a, a, a micro-level physical reality to it. Now, we have went through a number of characteristics of this curve, number one being the high accuracy that we saw, number two is a very broad range of validity, number three is the statistical robustness, and number four, it is physically meaningful. So therefore, uh, as a conclusion, we can, we can say that this relationship uh, appears to describe a micro-level thermodynamic feature of the planet and atmospheres heretofore unbeknown to science. What is the implication of that relationship? The implication is that the uh, uh, physical nature of the, green, of the so-called greenhouse effect is actually a pressure-induced thermal enhancement, which is independent of atmospheric composition. Because we have the atmospheric composition with partial pressure and so forth in the, our analysis and did not produce any meaningful relationship. Now, we, you have to remember this is a cross 
a broad range of conditions, much broader than, than occurs on Earth, and we're talking about long-term equilibrium temperature. So, uh, to finish with the question that we started with, what is the, uh, what do a diesel engine and Earth's climate system have in common? You can figure it out. Well, the answer is that both systems rise the internal temperature of the system, of the system to, through gas compression. So that's the new paradigm. So basically what we're saying here that there has been a confusion that has been going on for 190 years about the physical nature of the greenhouse effect being a radiative phenomenon. It is not a radiative phenomenon. It is actually a, a phenomenon caused by pressure. It's a, a pressure-induced thermal enhancement. But it's kind of hidden. If you don't, you don't see that until actually you do the analysis you know, to the planets. And the way it started back in 1824 with Joseph Fourier, he just expressed the notion it looks like the atmosphere works like a blanket. And it stops the cooling or it slows down the cooling. In fact, it's not, there is no stopping or slowing down of the cooling. It's just an enhancement of the energy that's coming from the sun because the energy that's coming from the sun is also a result of ph photon pressure, you, you can say. And uh, the, uh, this energy being absorbed by the Earth, it has been enhanced by the pressure of the atmosphere on Earth because it doesn't matter if it's a photon pressure or gas pressure, pressure always changes the temperature. So that's the fundamental new aspect. Thank you.